A problem today is not that we lack answers. We have more answers than we know what to do with. Every one of us, I wager, in this room has one of these in their pocket. This little device has more than 100,000 times the computing power of the computer that provided the guidance for the Apollo 11 moon landing mission. <coughs> Dwell on that for a second. Any one of us can ask this little device with a little bit of effort to tell us, take your pick, who were the antagonists in the Diet of Worms? Who were the antagonists in the 1963 World Series? Right? What is the length of a C-130? <laughs> we have unprecedented access to information and answers. In fact, the sum total of information and answers available to us today is greater than the sum total of knowledge available to all previous generations that have ever lived on the entire Earth throughout human history combined. We have an unprecedented volume of opinions, an unprecedented volume of PhDs, of academic and scientific experts, an unprecedented number of scholarly journals, an unprecedented number of schools and colleges and universities. We have an absurd, extravagant, super abundance of answers, and yet we are starved for knowledge. No one seems to find the answer satisfying, do they? Previous generations sent their best and brightest from their small villages off on dangerous voyages from which they might never return to cities like Paris and Bologna and Oxford to get answers. The most prized possessions in most family homes as recently as a century and a half ago were the King James Bible, the collected works of Shakespeare, and William Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England. Today, all of those institutions, all of those sources of knowledge are held in contempt by the vast majority of our friends and neighbors. How can we explain this? How can it be that we have more answers than ever and we have less satisfaction with the knowledge available to us? I want to suggest there's one very simple reason. And it's not what you might think. In my experience, it's not that we have all lost our desire to know the answers. Certainly some people have. I don't want to minimize the role of self-deception. It's a real problem. I don't want to minimize the extent to which people, many people, will go to nurture their own ignorance mm -hmm. so they can avoid assuming the responsibility that comes with knowledge. Knowledge of truth, of course, brings responsibility with it. But based on my extensive experience, especially teaching young people, both in academic and public intellectual settings, I think that the portion of the population who actively cultivate their own ignorance is actually much smaller than we've led, been led to believe. They just have an outsized influence because they're on Twitter and CNN. <laughs> the portion of the population that wants to remain in ignorance has a megaphone. But the majority of people who want to know what is true and right and beautiful are quietly waiting to be provided real answers, satisfying answers. In my experience, the vast majority of these quiet people care more about knowing what is real than they do about maintaining their beliefs for the sake of belief. I found this to be true even in some of the most skeptical academic settings in the various places around the world I have been privileged to teach and speak. So I don't think this is a uniquely Western phenomenon. I found this to be true in India, uh, just as I found it to be true in Western Europe and the United States. For most people, then, what I'm suggesting is that the problem is not a problem of the will. The problem is a problem of the intellect. Most people are lost morally because they're lost intellectually. They find themselves without any orientation dropped into a shouting match amongst angry, self-righteous factions who not only have radically incompatible opinions, but are actually having radically different conversations. We do not find the answers satisfying, in short, 
Because none of us knows what the question is. That's the problem. Here's the question that I think makes sense of all the answers around us. It's an old question, but we've forgotten how to ask it. The question simply is, what is a human being? The world needs someone to ask this question. The world needs a place where this question can be discussed. And that's what the Anglican American Council is trying to do. I think this question makes sense of the Black Lives Matter t-shirt wearing college student. The answer to this question, what is a human being, explains why all human beings should be afforded the presumption of innocence. Why race is never a valid reason to distinguish between different classes of persons. That's what that young college student's after. I think this question makes sense of the Trump flag flying on the fishing boat. Because the answer points to the aspirations of America properly understood that made her great in the first place. Expressed in documents such as the Declaration of Independence and the Northwest Territories Act, that all men are created, created equal. But the source of our rights is not government. The source of our rights is not cultural institutions. Our dignity is inherent and not a contingent cultural artifact. And that God endows us with an inherent dignity for which we are not dependent on governments of men. I think this, go this question makes sense of the woman waving the coat hanger in front of Chief Justice Roberts' house, wearing the My Body, My Choice sign. Ironically, this question makes sense of her answer about the inherent differences between men and women. And it makes intelligible the stunning beauty of Eve upon which Adam has trampled for half a century. I think this question even makes sense of the pronoun proclamation that you didn't ask for. <laughs> because what it does is it enables us to distinguish those aspects that are immutable and given by God from those aspects which God gives us the awesome power to shape through the radically, uh, the, the radically human capacity of free rational choice that he allows only to human beings and is the source of our unique dignity. So all of the world's answers that are being shouted at us in a cacophony at this moment in history, the t-shirt, the flag, the trunk flag, the coat hanger, the pronoun button, they're all desperate attempts to grasp for a question that people have forgotten how to ask. The only question that matters right now, at this moment. And they go wrong precisely because and to the extent that they answer the wrong question. So we have the question that makes sense of the world's answers. We encounter different expressions of this, of course, in the tradition with which we're all familiar, the psalmist asks, what is man that you are mindful of him? St. Paul had as many different formulations of this question as he had bad Christians to admonish. <laughs> Just to the Corinthian church, he had three or four different variations on this question. Do you not know that you will judge angels? Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? And do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? All these are questions derivative of the basic question, what is a human being? Who are you? What are you? How did God make you? This question, of course, is the beginning of all knowledge of the natural goods. Life, health, <laughs> friendship, marriage, beauty, justice, virtue, and knowledge itself. All the things that are worthwhile pursuing in our temporal existence. Everything that supplies genuine fulfillment in this life. And of course, as Christians, we know that the question also makes sense of all the supernatural goods, the eternal goods. Eternal life and friendship with God. For a human being just is the only being made in God's image. Whom most people will ever encounter during their earthly lives. 
to see a human being, to really see one human being, him or her, to understand his loves and her aspirations and his virtues and her sacrifices, is to quote that great font of theological knowledge, Les Miserables, <laughs> to see the face of God. And this is why this question doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong just to Jews and Christians and Broadway opera libretto writers. It belongs to all people who desire understanding of what is real, which is everyone. Here's the pagan Roman jurist Marcus Tullius Cicero writing decades before the birth of Christ. Quote, the creature of foresight, wisdom, variety, keenness, memory, endowed with reason and judgment, which we call man, was created by the supreme God to enjoy a remarkable status. Of all types and species of living creatures, he is the only one that participates in reason and reflection, whereas none of the others do. What is there? I will not say man, but of the whole of heaven and earth, more divine than reason. A faculty which, when it is developed and become complete, is rightly called wisdom. Couldn't we wish that many of the clergy who will step into pulpits on Sunday in America had this understanding of the radically unique capacities of a human being? What Cicero understood dimly by reason, what Paul in his letter to the Romans says is self-evident to all human beings, the Hebrew scriptures reveal, of course, with greater precision and clarity. We've been given the revelation. You know the passage. I want to suggest that this passage is the gospel of the 21st century because it answers the ultimate question that the world desperately wants and doesn't know how to ask. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. <coughs> So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, I'm just a layman, but there's a lot to say about this passage. And if I were to tell you everything that this passage provides in response to the question that the world doesn't know how to ask. Just as a layman, I would be keeping you here all night. It's all there, right? It's all there. Our embodiment, our rationality, our calling, our suitability for it, our radical equality as human beings, our radical differences as male and female, our generativity in natural loving response to God's first commandment, a radical equality as human beings who bear God's image, our creativity and rational ordering and natural loving response to God's second command, our nature, our purpose, our joy. Just one implication, of course, of this is this is the basis upon which the Christian jurists of Justinian in the 6th century became the first people in human history to articulate the argument for the abolition of slavery. This was the basis for the first abolition of slavery between the 6th and 10th centuries. This was the basis for the second abolition of slavery after it was reinstituted in the 18th and 19th centuries. This is the answer to the tribalism which afflicts us. We are not polygenesistic people. There is one genesis. There is one human race. There is one human nature. There is one human dignity. That's what the world needs to know. So if we have the question that the world doesn't know how to ask, but desperately wants to ask, and we have the answer that the world so desperately seeks, why don't we offer them to the world? I think there are as many reasons as there are Christians, but in the time remaining, I want to focus on two. First, in our desire to be sensitive, we refuse to be fully loving. Second, in our desire to be relevant, we refuse to be catechized. So first, 
We've come to believe that the loving response to the world's intellectual and moral cancer is to ignore it. That makes us bad physicians. I'll give you a concrete example. Several years ago, when uh, LGBT activists came to Alabama and challenged all of our marriage laws in federal courts, um, the Attorney General of Alabama deputized me to defend the rationality of marriage, to explain to federal judges why it's rational to defend to find marriage and law as a man-woman union. <clears throat> now, to my chagrin, as I went around the state trying to make this case, I quickly learned that the vast majority of churches, even in the buckle of the Bible Belt, refused to speak publicly on this issue. So I traveled around the state explaining to anyone who would listen what was at stake, how natural marriage secures the right of each child to be connected to his or her mother and father, the constitutional rights of churches and religious groups, a flourishing civic society was at stake, so many public goods that we take for granted. And unfortunately, I accurately predicted what would happen if we lost. How states would erase natural parents from original birth certificates and thus destroy the public records of the given nature of human beingness from the most vulnerable populations of children. How Christian adoption agencies and Christian schools would be forced to close. How the church's witness about the eternal kingdom, the marriage of Christ the bridegroom and his bride, the church, would become unintelligible and unattractive to entire generations of people once the true nature of natural marriage was erased from the public square. And we've seen all of these things come true, haven't we? Just in the seven years since Obergefell. And still the church remains largely silent. Why? I asked that question a lot back in 2014 and 2015, and the most common answer I received was some variation of this. Well, I can't speak about natural marriage in my church because I have too many divorced people and single mothers sitting in my pews, and I want them to know that Jesus loves them. I think that gets things backwards and upside down. When I spoke publicly about marriage, I never talked about divorced people or single parents or gays or lesbians. I simply talked about the nature of man and woman and the right of every child to be connected to his or her natural mother and father. Nevertheless, I consistently found that in nearly every room I walked into and spoke this message, the people who came up to me afterward were single mothers and divorcees and people struggling with same-sex attraction. And what I found was this, that by telling them the truth that they already knew, I gave them permission to grieve the loss that they did not know they had suffered. This was particularly true for, in the case of divorcees, those who had been divorced, those who had been abandoned. The culture tells them that this is the highest and best exercise of personal autonomy, and that there's nothing wrong with divorce. But their souls knew better. And they needed somebody to ask and answer the question so that they could be permitted to grieve the loss that their bodies knew they had suffered. Someone needed to give them permission to acknowledge the injustice they had suffered. How will the world know the depth of the injustice if no one will tell them what is just and good? God's plan for wholeness and fulfillment that was theirs by natural right and taken away. And how will they find hope if we do not explain to them how God's plan for eternity is to provide exactly that ultimate fulfillment of the longing that they now experience and cannot satisfy? We know what God's kingdom is. It just is a marriage between the eschaton man and the eschaton woman, Christ and his church. As we read in Ephesians 5, the joyous fulfillment that a husband finds in dying to the desires of himself to fulfill the desires of his wife, and that a wife finds in submitting to the husband who dies to his own desires for her sake, is just a type, a limited instantiation within time and space of the limitless joyous fulfillment that God promises to all who accept his free gift of resurrection, eternal life through the merits of his son the bridegroom. But simply, today, young people don't know what a human being is, so they don't know what marriage is, and because they don't know what marriage is, they do not desire it, and because they do not desire it, they don't desire the supernatural marriage, which is their 
consummation of all things, to its natural marriage points, and to which it prepares us to desire and anticipate. Of course, not everyone wants that, right? We know. For every expression of gratitude, believe me, I received at least one expression of, let's call it ingratitude, <laughs> as I labored to explain the rational goodness of natural marriage. But listen, Jeremiah was thrown down a well. I think I had it pretty easy. Second, in our desire to be relevant, we refuse to be catechized. Or put a little more precisely, we're better catechized in the ideology of Marcuse and Foucault than in the teachings of Augustine and Aquinas. More comfortable speaking in terms of personal identity and subjective experience than we are about reality and truth. We've accepted the lie that what's most essential to human nature is feeling and experience and that it is our responsibility to constitute our identities from scratch. And this, I want to suggest to you, imposes an impossible burden upon the souls of our young people. And if we would simply consult our own tradition, our own church fathers, our own church doctors, our philosophers and theologians, we would know what a human being is. It's not that. It is, in fact, four things in the tradition. A human being is a rational, embodied, eternal animal. We would know which aspects of our nature are given and immutable, and which are enlivened and life-giving, which are under our own dominion and control, and which are beyond, which are gifts that we received from God. We'll just walk briefly through them. This should all be relatively familiar to you, but I, I want you to think about these four aspects of our nature in response to this question that the, the world doesn't know how to ask. First, we have an animal nature, and this is the one thing you don't have to tell young people. <laughs> they already know that they're enslaved to their passions and appetites. To see, however, that they share this nature with the animals is to begin to see that God originally designed our desires and passions and appetites to lead us to the good. That's freedom. Second, we have an embodied nature. Our embodied nature is what makes us dependent upon each other. And being dependent makes us social. And being social is what gives our lives meaning. This is a gift from God, our embodiedness. To learn that maleness and femaleness are gifts from God, designed into our bodies, is to begin to reconnect those raging and constant feelings with the good order that God designed into our embodied nature from the beginning, and to understand how sin corrupts that good order. And to learn that we are finite beings, with limited abilities and time, is to be relieved of the impossible burdens to constitute ourselves and to save the world. The best gift you can give to a millennial or Gen Z today is to tell them this, it's not your job to save the world. That's freedom. The limitations of our embodied nature are very good. They make us dependent on each other, reliant upon God. That our bodies limit us is good news, gospel in our culture, which preaches that we can be anything we want to be. Tell the young people that it's okay. They aren't supposed to save the world. In fact, someone else already did. <laughs> Tell the harried parents that it's okay. They don't have to provide every opportunity for their children. Tell the lonely person that it's okay to crave a human touch. And the hungry person that it's okay to accept charity. And the bald guy that it's okay to show off his perfect paint. <laughs> I'm getting there. Come back in ten years. That's how God made us, and it is very good. That God made us man and woman, male and female, is also gospel today. We're all made in God's image. Each one of us reflects one half of that image and one half of God's eternal kingdom, which is just a union between the eschaton man and the eschaton bride. So it's no accident then that Ephesians 5 and Revelations 21 echo Genesis 1 and 2. The inherent differences between man and woman, husband and wife, father and mother, is the source of the life-giving honor of the man and the nurturing beauty of the woman and is the type and sense of our eternal participation and the ultimate, ultimate fulfillment that God promises to all those who believe in him at the end of all things. 
Our bodies are given to us as gifts. We do not inhabit them like houses or drive them like cars. My body is me. Your body is you. Of course, it's not all of you. But every other aspect of you is completely interpenetrated through it. With its maleness or femaleness, its strengths and weaknesses and limitations, all gifts, not things to be thrown away or despised. Gifts that enable us to receive grace and receive love. Gifts from God. That's for you. Our rational and soul nature, more than anything, our rational soul separates us from all the rest of creation. To understand that is what sets us apart from the animals. Our reason, our ability to know and choose what is good and right to do is to begin to understand the law written on our hearts, the natural law. To know ourselves as rational agents of free choice is also to know how we are all alike in dignity and inherent worth despite our various differences. To perceive that reason, is God's gift to rule the passions and to direct us to the good is to see that we have the means of true freedom for excellence. That the source and center of our inherent, uniquely human dignity is God's gift to lead us to fulfillment in this life and ultimately the Our rational and soul nature is the seat of God's image in us. Our reason is the capacity to act in the present as God acts over all eternity. To perceive the potential for good order, to choose and act to bring that order into existence. Our rational soul enables us to marry and raise children and to garden and to make music and art and poetry and to invent new technologies and to make new friendships. All states of flourishing that would not exist but for our radical acts of creation in the present. If we choose to participate with God, God allows us to act as he does, to be but for causes of little creations, as he is but for causes of all creation. And every human being you've ever met has this radical capacity, and is therefore a reason for action in his or her own way. And finally, our eternal nature. C.S. Lewis remarked, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. To perceive that a life of true happiness is a life lived not moment by moment, but rather from the perspective of the end of life, judged by reference to those good ends that reason discerns and points us to over the long term, is to see that we transcend time. And therefore, we must not ultimately have been created to live within it. Not always. And that our true identities will only ultimately be revealed from an eternal perspective. And that requires faith, and that's freedom. So with this free choice and this time transcendence reestablished on the high ground of knowledge and human understanding, finally we will be in a position to make the gospel intelligible to the world. Our neighbors will be able to understand and receive the good news. But I want to suggest not until then. And this is why the Daniel Declaration is so important. The Daniel Declaration is the American Anglican Council's invitation to ask the right question. It's a conversation. A place to stand, of course, was an important statement of clarity in a moment of confusion about the authority of scripture and the role of the church in the 1990s and early 2000s. The Daniel Declaration speaks clearly to those questions. But it also speaks clearly to a new generation who are asking the wrong questions in this moment. It cuts through the new confusions which have sprung up in the last two decades and which threaten to keep people from the love of God. The declaration starts with the triune God and it covers familiar theological ground, such as the primacy of scripture and the creeds, the mission of the Christian, the importance of congregational life, but it doesn't stop there. And what's new in the Declaration is not innovative, but rather confronts new obstacles that prevent people from desiring and seeking God. Confusion about human identity, the value of human life, the nature of sexuality and marriage. Behind all of those issues is the one basic question 
what is a human being? And so we join the psalmist and Aristotle and Cicero and St. Paul and Augustine and Aquinas and all the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us in asking and answering that question for a world that desperately wants the conversation. And we thank you for partnering us in that effort. Thank you. Thank you.